would like to um, welcome everyone and let you know that I'm Angie Moxley. I work with Georgia College and State University in Milledgeville. Uh, I support this webinar of technology for the University of Georgia Extension and would like to introduce you to the host of this webinar session, um, Dan, Dr. Dan Suter. He's a professor of urban pest management in the Department of Entomology at the University of Georgia. He is located on the UGA Griffin campus. Dr. Suter has worked with the pest control industry since 1987. Dan would like to welcome you and introduce you to our speaker for today. Dan? Well, thank you, Angie. And uh, Dr. Phil Kaler is currently the Margie and Dempsey Staff Endowed Professor of Structural Pest Control or the FPMA Endowed Professor of Urban Entomology at the University of Florida in Gainesville. His research responsibilities include the development uh, uh, an investigation of new technologies for management of urban pests, um, uh, mainly cockroaches, termites, flies, and bed bugs. His primary emphasis is on reduction of pesticide usage in uh, urban environments. His research program studies biological factors of pests that affect uh, growth and development. Dr. Taylor's extension duties include the development of educational materials and uh, programs in urban livestock and poultry pest management. His primary extension emphasis has been on education of the pest control industry in Florida and the United States for nearly uh, 40 years. Methods have been to develop books, fact sheets, and computerized instruction in urban pest management. And on a personal note, uh, Dr. Kaler was my professional mentor starting 25 years ago, Dr. Kaler, <laughs> for almost a decade. So, uh, Dr. Kaler, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. You can talk to us about uh, pesticide safety. Thank you, Dan. It certainly is a, a pleasure to be able to talk about pesticide safety. And that's actually a fairly broad subject. So I decided to try to try to narrow it down to just addressing how to protect, how an applicator can protect themselves from, from pesticide applications and particularly with PPE. Now what I chose on this particular slide is we had a rather wet year in North Florida and we had a lot of Sorophora ciliata, which is a, the common name of it is a feathery-legged gallinipper. And you can see the size of that particular mosquito that uh, they usually attack sometime around uh, sunrise. So anyway, there was a lot of reason to be able to try to control uh, insects in the uh, in and around homes this year. Of course, any time that you're applying pesticides, you should uh, really proceed at your own risk. You need to try to protect yourself and also protect others from the pesticides. And of course, this isn't a, a good spine to put up, proceed at your own risk uh, for people that might be going into a sprayed area. But it does give an idea that, that, uh, that pesticides are something that, that can be dangerous. Now, some of the folks that are online may not understand that I'm not exactly a cat lover. So, so I always try to include some things that we do to cats. For instance, this cat needs to proceed as, at its own risk because there's a dog there just ready to jump on it. Now, what I wanted to start out with is to take a look at a couple of pesticide labels and also uh, the idea that the label is what, what is going to give you advice on what personal protective equipment should be used. And one thing that's often overlooked is that, the, and I know that I'm not telling you anything new here, is the label is the information that's printed on the pesticide container. And if something that's provided by the manufacturer, it has to be approved by EPA. And it's against the law to use a product in a manner that is inconsistent with the label. So that's something that everyone who is a pesticide applicator knows. However, one of the things that I found is that most of the pesticide labels have a PPE statement. There are, there are a lot of baits that do not have a PPE statement. They don't require you to use uh, personal protective equipment. However, most of the labels that are used by the pest management industry have some sort of a, a PPE statement. And my interpretation of that 
is that it is really against the law to not use the correct personal protective equipment that's on the label. Not only is, and, and often people take the idea, have the concept that this is something that is advisory, something that you should do to protect yourself. It's not a big deal if you don't do it. However, it is something that, that could be regulated by, uh, by regulators anywhere where pesticides are being used. So, so for instance, uh, we currently have in Florida the requirement for vehicle inspection where the, the technician would have to provide the label for products that are on the truck to an inspector, and the inspector can, can, can ask that person to interpret the label for him and actually give him the label to, to help, him, help him in his response. They almost never, they always get into the directions for use, but never into the PPE statement. And I'm going to take a look at several of the labels to see what, what's on the label and what, uh, what should be used as far as protection. A lot of people are using Pyramidal or Cipronil uh, in, their, in, in their pest control service. And on the label, they say for clothing, no long sleeve shirt, Long pants, socks, and shoes is, are required. For hand protection, they say chemical resistant gloves. And for protective eyewear, especially if you're in crawl spaces or basements or confined areas, that uh, goggles, face shield, uh, safety glasses with front, brow, and temple protection are required. And for respiratory protection, MSHA. TC21C or NIOSH, NRP or HE uh, uh, cartridges. So that's on the label. And people that I've talked to have not been able to interpret uh, parts of this language uh, very effectively. Now, if you go on to another label, you, you find that it's a rather standard uh, process for EPA to require the manufacturers to put on some clothing requirements like long sleeve shirt, long pants, socks, and shoes. That's identical. Hand protection is different on this label compared to the Thermidor label. Uh, for, for Demon Max, uh, which is cyphermethrin, it's requiring barrier laminate, nitrile rubber, and neoprene or Viton uh, all with a thickness greater than 14 mils. And for protective eyewear, it's saying goggles, face shields, safety glasses, uh, similar to the Thermador label. And then the respiratory protection is a little bit different in that it's requiring NIOSH, NRP, and HE cartridge, or o OV plus NRP and, or HE pre-filter, and then TC19C or TC13F. To take a look at another label, Clothing is identical for, for dragnet. Hand protection, they say chemical resistant gloves, very similar to the Thermidor wording. Uh, eye protection, any protective eyewear. And then respiratory protection, uh, TC23C, TC21C, TC19C, all of these, uh, all of these MSHA, MSHA and NIOSH uh, requirements. And then a NIOSH and RP or HE cartridge or OV, NRP, or HE pre-filter. Now, all of that I found to be very confusing when I started comparing labels and saying, well, what is really needed for personal protection? You have to uh, abide by the requirements, but each one is slightly different in what they're requiring. And so what I wanted to do was break this apart, and really the outline for this talk is for us to talk about protective clothing first, then eye protection, then hand protection, and then respiratory protection from the standpoint of how to, uh, how to, uh, how to select the correct, uh, the correct equipment. Okay, let's talk about the protective clothing. Protective clothing comes in a variety of materials. So, a lot of people are using Tyvek, which is a paper-like fabric. It's disposable suits or uh, coveralls. 
and as protection against dust and flashes. There are also treated wool and cotton materials, and there are also rubber or rubberized fabrics like neoprene or plastic. The thing that I found is that Tyvek, which most of the industry is using, may not be the best for pest control. It's considered a lightweight protection against hazardous dry particles. This is right off of the DuPont website and aerosols, and non-hazardous light liquid splash. Now, you can see that pesticides are not non-hazardous material. And it is going to be very good in protecting against small size hazardous particles. And it's also going to be very good in protecting you if you're going into a crawl space or into an attic area. What I found is that uh, there's a similar, uh, similar material, but better protection, which is for chemical protection, which is the Tychem product. And there are several different products uh, that that provide different kinds of, of protection. So for instance, Tychem CPF3 is a durable fabric uh, against a broad range of chemicals. Tychem F is for broad chemical barrier protection. And Tychem SL is a durable fabric against a range of chemical environments. And if you take a look at this uh, protective coverall chart, you can see that there are uh, there are different classes. First of all, if we start here on the bottom for a signal word on the pesticide label, if it's a danger product, it, the, the, the coverall would protect from a class one. Uh, a warning label, a class, a class two product would, would protect against, and a class three would be precaution. So, for instance, if we take a look at Tyvek here, you can see that Tyvek is going to provide. Uh, particulate uh, protection uh, for class one. It is going to be class three protection for just caution materials for, for splash. It's not liquid proof. It's not liquid chemical protection. It is very breathable and it's reasonably low cost. So everyone kind of likes Tyvek as a choice. But it, if you go to Tyvek uh, QC, you can see that uh, particulate class one uh, uh, for that particular product, it's it's better for splash protection. It's not liquid proof. It does give liquid chemical protection. It is not breathable, so it would be uh, very hot to wear, and it is a reasonably low cost. Once you get down to uh, uh, Tyvek QC, you can see that there are differences here where it is liquid proof and it is liquid chemical because it has sealed seams. And then when you get down to Tychem, it's going to give you protection against uh, danger uh, for both flash, flash and particulate protection. And it is not liquid proof, but it, is, uh, it will provide liquid chemical protection. It is not breathable and, uh, and there's a higher cost for, for, for the chemical protection. So those are some of the things that you have to have to look at and and be able to determine whether you're going to select one protective coverall from another uh, when you're handling when you're handling the product. Okay, let's talk about protecting the arms. There are several ways to protect the the arms from from splashes. And of course, we're talking about clothing. Clothing is supposed to be long, uh, long pants, shoes, plus socks, uh, long sleeve shirt. Now there, there are uh, disposable long sleeves that are pictured here in this picture. You can see these are disposable sleeves, and we have some regulators now that are saying that sleeves are not a long sleeve shirt, so they're not the correct. Uh, a chemical protection, and that is a violation of the label if you use a long uh, if you use a long sleeve as opposed to a long sleeve skirt. So the use of these sleeves may be a label violation. However, there may be other reasons for you to use uh, use a sleeve, and that would be like if you have a technician that has tattoos 
and you don't want the customers to be able to see those tattoos, there are tattoo cover sleeves that are available to, uh, to provide that sort of protection. And of course, there are the cat leggings that actually I saw this on some folks uh, back, a, uh, back a couple of years ago uh, on campus that they were wearing these, these cat leggings, which was rather interesting. Foot protection is, is very critical. And actually, there's an OSHA requirement, OSHA 29 CFR. Uh, which says that employees who face possible foot or leg injuries from falling or rolling objects or from crushing or penetrating materials should wear protective footwear. So, so basically, uh, there is a requirement uh, that if you're going to be exposed to falling or rolling objects or from crushing or penetrating materials, that you should wear that uh, protective footwear. Cases where you, you might think about that would be if you're going into crawl spaces or if you're going into attics and you might be stepping on a nail or uh, or if you're working with something heavy on the truck and it would fall and uh, fall on a foot. What's interest, what was interesting to me is uh, the safety shoes have the impact resistant toes and and protection for the for the sole. And they used to have an ANSI minimum compression and impact performance standard, which now has been replaced with two new ASTM uh, uh, international standards that, that, that are there for protective footwear. Uh, one thing that is often used in the industry are shoe covers or boot covers in, so that if you're going into someone's house that you're not dragging dirt into their house. It has nothing to do with, with foot protection from chemicals, but it does have something to do with protecting your customer's belongings uh, from, uh, from dirt. So when we're looking at hand protection, you could use any of these gloves if the label says chemical resistant gloves. Now, I would be uh, suspect that uh, latex, I, I went to a website and they said they listed all of their kinds of, of chemical resistant gloves and they had latex on there which is water resistant and I wouldn't consider it chemical resistant at all. But you have all these choices to choose from, nitrile, neoprene, um, coated latex, neoprene, uh, you, you have uh, butyl, uh, and and there are a wide variety PVC gloves. There are a wide variety of gloves that, that you can choose from. You need to be aware, however, that you can't choose one glove and have it fit all of the chemicals that uh, that, that might be used by a technician. Some labels are very specific about the kinds of gloves that they they would like you to wear. So, for instance, uh, you need to select the proper hand protection for, for this particular label. If the label says chemical resistant gloves, you can use any chemical resistant gloves. However, in this particular case, the label for, for Demon Max says some materials are chemical resistant to this pro are chemical resistant to this product are barrier laminate, nitrile rubber greater than 14 mils, neoprene rubber greater than 14 mils, phyton greater than 14 mils. So and then they go on, and, and I was interested that EPA has actually come out with a chart now to make life easier for you. If you want more options, follow the instructions for category E on the EPA chemical resistance category selection chart. So for this particular label, you'd have to go to EPA's chemical resistance chart and choose category E. Uh, EPA has that chemical resistance chart up on the web, and this is this is the chart, and it has a particular type of personal protective equipment. So let's go down here to the bottom. High, uh, high would be highly chemical resistant. Clean or replace PPE at the, at the end of each day's work period, and rinse pesticides off at rest breaks. 
moderate would be moderately chemical resistant, clean or replace PPE within an hour or two of contact. Slight would be slightly chemical resistant, clean or replace PPE within 10 minutes of contact. And then none would be no chemical resistance. Do not wear this type of material as PPE when contact is possible. And you can see the matrix that they have here for all of the different kinds of uh, uh, personal protective equipment, uh, uh, per personal protective material that's available. And if we take a look at the example that I gave you, category E on this chart is high chemical resistance for barrier laminate, slight for butyl rubber, high for nitrile rubber, high for uh, neoprene, slight for natural rubber, none for polyethylene, moderate for polyvinyl chloride, and high for Viacom. So basically you have uh, different choices that are on this chart that give you some guidance on, on which gloves to use and when you need to decontaminate uh, uh, based on the, the classification of the, of the gloves. Okay, so I went to some websites to see what these gloves would look like. And of course, the greatest protection is going to be something like a barrier laminate glove, which they say here is the state of the art five layer uh, laminated film glove with the broadest range of chemical protection. And uh, that is something that's probably fairly expensive too. Um, you have uh, these Viton uh, gloves up here that are available. You have nitrile gloves that are available. You have neoprene gloves that are available. And you have to select the correct hand protection for the product that's being used. And that's why I'm saying that maybe some of the regulators are going to get involved with this eventually. If you have a product on the truck and you don't have the correct uh, protective equipment, they can probably say that you have a label violation. And of course, there are gloves for grabbing cats that are very specialized for that. Okay, let's talk about uh, selecting the proper eye protection. Uh, eye protection is something that we all kind of uh, take for granted. You have safety glasses that are available. You have side shield uh, glasses that are available. You have goggles that, that are available. And you have face shields. So under OSHA, it says that the employer shall ensure that each affected employee uses appropriate eye or face protection when exposed to uh, eye or face hazards from flying particles and also liquid chemicals. And you don't often think about it, but there, uh, there are particles uh, that are generated by aerosols that you want to protect your eyes from. And there are also liquid spills and flashes that, that may get into the eye. So all of these are appropriate for certain chemicals, but not all chemicals. You have to select the correct one. And of course, that may include cats as well that may maybe need to select the correct chemical. OK, so as far as selecting the proper eye protection, there are benefits and drawbacks to the different types of, of, of glasses. So for instance, safety glasses will protect against a variety of hazards. And they're going to offer limited flash protection because the liquid can flow up around the frame. So these glasses are not very good if you splash chemical on your on your face and you may get them in the eyes because they would go around the edges of, of the glasses. The side shields are a good protection when, when used with safety glasses, and they, they're going to offer limited flash protection as well. Goggles are going to cover the eye sockets or the eyes and part of the face. And the ventilated uh, goggles, however, may permit fine powders and liquids to, to reach the eyes. And then face shields are going to provide sound protection uh, when worn with safety glasses. When worn alone, the shield does, uh, does not sit close enough to the eye to safeguard against, against some object. So there are benefits and drawbacks to each one of these, uh, these eye protective materials. So let's take a look at a label and see what's required for, uh, for eye protection. So this is the Max label that I'm going to pick on again. And 
the Demon Max uh, label says that when working in non-ventilated space, all pesticide handlers must wear protective eyewear, goggles, and or a face shield, and or a shield and safety glasses with front, brow, and temple protection. And so, which ones of which of these products are appropriate for this material? Basically, it comes down to the safety glasses are not something that are listed as PPE. The side shields are not listed as PPE. These safety glasses, however, would be okay because they do have the, the, the front and brow and temple protection. The goggles are appropriate because they're listed as, as appropriate PPE. And the face shield is also listed as appropriate PPE. So even though there are certain products that, uh, that these safety glasses and these side shields would be appropriate for, they're not appropriate for this particular label. And of course, if you have a cat eye versus a human eye, and if you get something in the eye, you're going to get bloodshot eyes. The real tricky part is what respirator would you use uh, for uh, for pesticide application? And this is uh, this is a very difficult subject to take on because it is uh, it's extraordinarily complex. And some labels don't really help you out a lot with respiratory protection. And actually, it's one of the most important kinds of protection because when you have exposure uh, through the airways, it, it, it's one of the most uh, drastic ways to get an, an insecticide into you. So, so for instance, this is a label that says, wear pesticide respirator jointly approved by Mining Enforcement and Safety Administration and the uh, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health under the provisions of 30 CFR uh, Code of Federal Regulations Part 2. Um, I must admit when I've seen that on labels, and I've never understood exactly what it meant. And I've never been at a meeting with the pest control industry uh, uh, to explain what it meant. And when I go to the websites, they aren't much help either, because I went to this one website that supplies uh, respirators. And my question is, which one would you choose for appropriate protection? Because it lists 73 chemical cartridges. 52 uh, combination cartridges and 32 filters, and and it's crazy to me that there are some that are appropriate for certain labels and some that are not appropriate for certain labels, and there is not a whole lot of help out there for you. So selection has now been simplified by EPA. Some of the older labels are going to say that MSH. Uh, a NIOSH, uh, uh, they're going to refer to the respirator approval numbers. The new labels will list the respirator with the, with the NIOSH approval label and, and the new IOSH approved respirator. And so, for instance, it's going to say NIOSH approved TC23C uh, with a pre filter approved for pesticides. Now, the, the thing that you need to understand is that there are two ways that pesticides are going to uh, get into your respiratory system. Uh, one would be with particulate, the other would be through vapors. And respiratory protection needs to be for, in some cases, for both vapors and for uh, particulates. So the personal protective equipment on this particular label says a NIOSH approved dust filtering respirator, so that's going to protect from, from particulates. And also, uh, you need to consider uh, vapor protection as well. And of course, the HE high efficiency filter is used with, uh, with an air purifying respirator only. OK, now, that doesn't really explain very well what all of these numbers mean. But, and they've actually simplified things even more now where respirator filters and cartridges are now color coded to make it easier, but the color coding is not something that is on the label. Okay, so let's start out with how to protect yourself from particulates, and, and that's, a, that's the first stage of respiratory protection. 
first of all, you have to choose a filter efficiency that is either 95, 99, or 100 percent, which is uh, actually 99.97 percent. And in most cases, you would want to choose a 100 percent filter efficiency. However, uh, it doesn't really tell you on the PPE statement that you have to do that. You can probably choose 95 or 99, depending on the exposure requirement. The next question that, that, that you need to answer is, does the particle that you're protecting yourself contain oil? If no, you can use either an N-series, an R-series, or a P-series filter. If the answer is yes, that it does contain oil, then it's going to be necessary for you to maintain a time log on, on that particular filter to make sure that, the, that the, the oil does not break through your respiratory protection. And then, will the filter be used for more than eight hours? If yes or you don't know, then you use a P-series filter. If no, you can use an N-series or an R-series filter. So this flow chart is, is very helpful in, in letting you decide for a particular product what you're going to be able to use and whether you actually need to maintain a time log uh, for the product that, that you're going to, uh, going to apply. And of course, there's kitty PPE as well. You could, uh, you could uh, uh, maybe uh, entertain your customers with a respirator like this. Okay, so let's take a look. A, a particulate filter is required for for this particular product label. It says all pesticide handlers must wear a dust mist filtering respirator um, um, with an approved uh, with an approved number of, of category of N R P or H E when working in a non ventilated Space, including but not limited to crawl spaces and basements. So basically, a particulate filter would be required for, for this particular product. And it's rather scary when you're dealing with, with respiratory protection. Now, your big question is what are these N, R, and P? And of course, we, we talked a little bit about the uh, choosing the efficiency of the respirator. N is for non-oil aerosols. R is includes oil aerosols, and P includes also includes oil aerosols. So the N uh, respirators are going to be for non-oil. The R and P would be for oil, and it depends on how long you're going to be exposed, whether you use an R or a P. So uh, if you if you notice. Use according to manufacturer's time use restrictions when, uh, when oil particles are present. And you may have a time use restriction on the R, R series filters. So these, are, these categories here are for oil resistance. OK, so I told you that these things are color coded. It was very interesting to me that you can actually take a look at these particulate filters and tell whether they're good for oils or for non-oils. White is for non-oil particulates, and magenta is, is used for oil particulates. So the color coding can be very useful for you. you you'd use magenta if you have oil in aerosol that you have that you're putting out and you want rest and you need respiratory protection. You can use white for, for instance, for some of the dust that don't have any oils in them and you just want to uh, protect yourself from those, those particulars. So if we take a look here, these are some of the uh, some of the filters that are available. You can see that this is a 3M particulate filter. It's magenta in color. It provides respiratory protection for nuisance level uh, 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 relief. It's magenta colored, so it's going to uh, uh, it's going to protect you from oil-based particulates. This is a multi-acid organic vapor uh, cartridge that is white in color, and it has a particulate uh, pre-filter, which is going to take the filters out before it gets to the the rest of the cartridge. 
So uh, the magenta versus white is a very easy way for you to look to see whether uh, whether uh, whether the product is going to protect you, whether that particular filter is going to protect you from oil-based or non-oil-based products. And I found it interesting there are even T100 cats out there. Okay, so in this particular case, it says you must wear a NIOSH approved respirator with an organic vapor cartridge or a canister with RP or HE pre filter. So the pre filter is for the particulates. This is going to require an organic vapor filter uh, uh, in, in order to protect you uh, from, the, from the vapors. So remember, there, there are two aspects to respiratory protection you have the particulates and you have vapor. For this particular label, label a vapor filter is required in addition to a particulate. Now, the NIOSH use classification uh, identifies the different kinds of contaminants that treated carbon grains will, will capture. And there are different, uh, different colors based on what is going to, uh, going to, uh, going to be captured on the, on the carbon, uh, carbon part of the filter. So, for instance, uh, these are color; these are all color coded. However, um, on the label, it's going to tell you that you need protection from like organic vapors or many of the products that are in insecticidal. So, so this 3M coding says uh, this organic vapor uh, cartridge is black in color. Um, you also have an organic vapor acid gases, which would be yellow in color. And you also have a multi-gas uh, vapor cartridge that can be olive in color. And then you can also have combination cartridges that would be for like formaldehyde plus organic vapor, which would be olive and black in color. So basically, you have color coding for appropriate ones. When I took a look at some of the uh, some of the chemical cartridges that are being sold to in the industry, a lot of them are black in color or olive in color. Or even uh, sometimes even yellow in color. The ones that are not appropriate for use would be, for instance, the mercury vapor chlorine gas, which would be orange, the ammonia methylamine, uh, which would be green, and the acid gases, which would be uh, which would be white in color. So remember, these are uh, for vapors. The ones that we talked about previously were for particulates. So this is like an organic vapor cat. <laughs> uh, that is colored black. Okay, so what do these things look like? So you can take a look, and, and like I said, these are color coded. Where is the color coding? It's actually on the label that surrounds the cartridge. You can tell what it's going to protect from by the color of of that particular uh, uh, that particular label. So if you take a look at the olive uh, at the olive up top. It says that it's an organic vapor, ammonia, methylamine, formaldehyde, and a, a wide variety of, of gases. If you take a look at this black one, it's for organic vapors only. And if you take a look at this yellow one, it's organic vapor and acid gases like chlorine, hydro, hydrogen chloride, sulfur dioxide, that sort of thing. So basically, you have some cartridges that are going to be appropriate for pest control and other ones which are not going to be appropriate for pest control. So in this particular case, you have a yellow cat, so that's going to be an organic vapor acid cat. Okay, in this particular case, uh, a combination filter may be appropriate. So you have the vapor plus particulate uh, protection for, uh, for this particular cartridge. So what it says here, a NIOSH approved respirator with an organic vapor cartridge or canister with an RP or HE pre-filter. So what you're looking at here is possibly you would want to use a, uh, a combination cartridge as opposed to getting a cartridge separate from the, from the pre-filter. So the combination cartridges are going to look something like this. And if you remember, magenta is for oil-based products. And then the vapors are going to be color-coded on, on the side of this. So basically, you have the, uh, 
the organic vapor cartridge with a P100 particulate filter. So this is going to be 99.97 uh, for particulates, and it's going to protect you from organic vapors. So this one would be appropriate for, for pesticide application. Also, this would be a magenta pre-filter with an organic vapor uh, uh, cartridge. And, and then you have protection from organic vapors and acid gases and a cartridge with a P100 particulate pre-filter uh, for, for the oil, partic for oil particulates. So this is what, a, what an organic vapor cartridge with a P100 particular pre-filter would look like. You can see that here's the label on the side that's yellow in color with a magenta uh, pre-filter. So you have better protection than, than just having a yellow, uh, yellow cartridge. And they even have caps that are organic vapor and uh, P100 filters. So if we take a look at uh, at this whole thing, you can see that it is quite complex to protect yourself from uh, from uh, from the standpoint of respiratory protection. Uh, that you need to choose a safe level of protection. If you're not sure, you really should choose the safest type of protection, which would be the Type 100 or a HEPA protection. Uh, 95, the Type 95 would be 95% efficient. It's going to be appropriate for most dust, mold, and mist. You could choose a type 97, which would give you a little more protection than the 95, or the type 100. But basically, if you're not sure what protection you should have, choose a, choose a 100, a P100, uh, to protect yourself. And of course, a lot of the pesticide mist that you're using may contain oil particles. And the manufacturers don't have to tell you whether it contains oil particles. It's usually in the uh, in the PPE statement where they're going to suggest uh, which particular filters to use. If you're not sure what's what's in a product, you really should use a P or an HE filter. Of course, the N is not going to be resistant to oil. You shouldn't use it with any of the any of the particulates or aerosols that contain oil. R would be resistant to oils that can only be used for up to eight hours. P would be oil proof, and you should uh, you can use them uh, for more than eight hours. And uh, the HE is high efficiency, and it's for use in combination uh, respirators. Then that was for the particulate protection. Then you need to think about gas and vapor uh, protection for your respiratory system. So you want to choose the correct color-coded cartridge. If you're not sure, choose olive. Black is for organic vapors. Yellow is for organic vapors uh, plus, uh, plus acid gases. And olive is for uh, multi-gas uh, organic vapors. So the respiratory protection with the, with the cartridge, if you're not sure, choose the combination uh, respirator. It protects against particles as well as gases and vapors. That would be a magenta P100 uh, pre-filter and an olive-coated uh, olive cartridge. Well, basically, can't think, use a respirator. And remember, even though this is all uh, pretty, uh, these are all very difficult concepts, remember the label is the law. It's against the law to use a product in a manner inconsistent with the label. It's also against the law not to use the correct personal protective equipment that is listed on the label. You would be uh, breaking the label if you use the wrong PPE. You're also not going to be protected from the chemicals that you're putting out, and it is very unsafe for you to do that. Uh, you want to choose the correct PPE to comply with the with the with the PPE statement on the label. So, so basically, uh, I've tried to give you some background information on how to select the uh, 
of these products correctly. And you don't want to be like this cat that did not wear the correct PPE that was on the label. And of course, when the cat goes into the litter box, it's going to say, I should have worn a respirator before going there. And I know there are going to be a lot of questions that we need to deal with because I've been in a lot of educational programs and I've never been at one that addressed these particular issues before. That it that turns out that that when I've when I've done parts of this program for the pest control industry, everyone gets very uh, very upset because they had no idea there was this variety of PPE that's available. Some of it is appropriate for certain products, and some of it is not appropriate for certain products. So. Uh, I think that we probably need to address a few questions. Dan, do you have some there? Yeah, great. Yeah, Dr. Carroll, we had a numerous questions come in. And uh, by the way, who, who knew that this was so complicated? I think you're right. This is a uh, when you when you delve into the details of proper PPE on a label, this is the kind of thing that kind of jumps out at you. And you gave some really really good information here, and kind of I think maybe this is the first step towards or towards Really delving into some of these, uh, some of these, some of these details. But yeah, so I tried to give, I tried to give him the handout, some of the charts, so that you'd be able to go back and review and be able to select the correct PPE based on the benefits and uh, disadvantages of each one. Yeah, that, and I, yeah, I'm glad. I, I remember now that you did send that that uh, that PowerPoint out, and that's very important. Probably needed more than an hour for this. It's uh Seems like a pretty complicated topic, but w the first question here comes from India, and uh, I think you probably did address this. But what uh, what type of respiratory protection would be advised for fogging with delta methrin? And I I think that's probably in okay, your when you're when you're fogging, it depends on whether you're using an oil-based delta methrin or a water-based delta methrin. If it's if it's oil-based, you should should probably use a, a P100 plus you'd want an organic vapor cartridge, but basically take a look at the PPE statement on the label of the product that you're using to figure out exactly what the proper uh, respiratory protection would be. And it's going to tell you whether it should uh, whether it should be an N or a P or uh, or an olive co uh, coated uh, cartridge or not. Yeah, that that's good. I'm, and this really gets back to I'm, I'm glad you did send out those those slides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I hope everyone has the ability to be able to uh, to uh, use the handouts because I think that, that that those handouts are very critical for interpreting that information on the PPE statement. Yeah, so the next question we had come in was uh, uh, again from India, and uh, and I had a couple of people that that actually made this uh, observation that with uh, with some gloves. There's, you have sweating inside the gloves, you know, hot in July and you know whatever. But is there a way to avoid that kind of thing, or any way to to get gloves that don't don't result in sweating inside and in pools of sweat inside your gloves? Unfortunately, the gloves that are going to give the best protection from chemicals are not going to be breathable, and so they're going to be very hot. But I know I've been in situations where I put on gloves and and within 10 minutes, the gloves are filled up with water. But uh, some of the gloves, they have liners that are uh, that are like cotton liners or wool liners so that there is water absorption, uh, so that your sweat is absorbed uh, into the glove and it, it doesn't become uh, uh, filled up with water and then you're not able to feel anything uh, that, that you're touching. However, the problem yeah. with those gloves is that, that that liner then becomes a place where pesticides can get absorbed, and then it can be a hazard from the standpoint of, uh, of, of thermal thermal contact with the chemical. So you have to be careful that you don't get any of the right. pesticides inside a glove that is lined like that. That's right. Uh, next question: uh, you, you had talked earlier on about Tyvek versus Tykem. Where would you buy? Tycam, and, and I guess this is a more of a broad question for a lot of the respirator equipment. And do uh, you have any recommendations on where you might go to actually purchase some of this stuff? 
Well, I, w I was amazed when I got into it that Tyvek was not appropriate for for most pesticide applications, but it's good for particular protection. So if you're crawling through the mud or if you're crawling through dusty areas like either the crawl space or the attic, but as far as protection from liquid chemical splashes, it will not protect you from that. You have to go to something like uh, like Tychem, and Tychem should be available. It's a DuPont product, and it should be available at the same places that you would buy uh, by the Tyvek. However, I don't think that it's a common thing that is supplied by the uh, by the distributors of pesticides, and it's something that they probably should think about putting into their product line. Yeah, it doesn't seem to me you're going to go to your your local uh, distributor and fund this kind of type of equipment. No, these are the, uh, these are readily available. Actually, they're readily available online, so it's it's not difficult if you uh, if you plan ahead and and get it in. Yeah, uh, but I was just amazed is, because everyone. I, I was amazed because everyone is using Tyvek, but um, <laughs> but it's not appropriate for liquid uh, chemical splashes at all. Yeah, that. That, that was worth the presentation there to learn that. So the next question here is where did there was a uh, several people had this question. There was a, a chart that had the protective coverall information on there. Do you have a resource for that? Where did that chart come from? I think that actually came from the extension in Washington State. Washington There's State. So if they somebody Googled yeah, Washington the State, in, the Pesticide Information Office at Washington State University. Okay. Um, it was an extension publication that I pulled that out of. I probably should have put the source there, but anyway, you have that uh, that chart there that's available for you. Okay, we got another one in here. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, another question here about uh, excessive uh, perspiration. I think you've addressed that pretty well. Uh, yeah, don't and, sweat. <laughs> what's that? Yeah, yeah. Don't only sweat. worked during January. <laughs> Uh, you had another. I had another question about there was you had an EPA website. There was a chart that you had from EPA. It was later on in the in the uh, later on in your presentation. It was another chart, and I, it was an EPA. You you had said that you got this. Yeah, it's available EPA on the EPA site. I know that EPA sites are very confusing. What I did was uh, when I saw that on the label that there was a chart like that, which I was not aware, that is brand new uh, label language that I wasn't aware of up until uh, putting this talk together, that they had actually in recent months just generated that chart. And I went ahead and did a Google search and it came right up. So if okay. you just search for that, uh, 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 that the, the title of that chart, it, yeah. it, it will come right up and you can access it very easily. Um, I had no idea that they had gone ahead to that classification. You'll find that a lot of the new labels that are coming out of EPA now, I think almost all of them that require chemical uh, protective uh, uh, fabric, that, that, it, that they're going to have that listing of, of, of that chart, that, and, you, and you'll need to refer to that. Yeah. OK, next question here is, uh, are the uh, it's kind of a lengthy question, but are the hour recommendations for exposure to a product only for exposure to ambient air? It seems to, they seem to recall cartridge labels making some sort of distinction along these lines: ambient air exposure. My interpretation is that you want to have a, a time log on your respirator if you're dealing with with oils because you don't want to exceed that eight hours for mm -hmm. certain. Uh, Certain types of, of of vapor protection. Yeah, he might. You're he not might really mean, going to have a, a knowledge that the, that the chemical is broken through, especially with the oil based uh, oil based uh, particles. You, you you won't know from the standpoint of odor or anything. So you need to keep that time log. Yeah. All right, we're getting lots of thank yous here, Dr. Kaler. I, I I don't see a whole lot of other. There's not a lot of other questions here. Anybody have any other questions? Uh, I mean, I I think this is a this is a very good. Uh, Greg had a question here: saturation of filter in general versus chemical saturation. In other words, I think that's what he's getting at: is is uh, in ambient air in clean air. I mean, I I think what he's getting at is that eight hour limit is probably when you're is that crawl space eight hours versus 
sitting in your truck. Uh, you, know, you see what I mean here? So okay, eight, yeah, uh, eight hours be, of use. Uh, when you're dealing with the time log, if your uh, if your respirator is, for instance, in a in a bag protected from from the atmosphere, uh, that is not time that uh, that you put on the respirator. The time is the wear time, which is when you're breathing through the respirator and pulling particulates in. So that's where the time log would be a start time for when you put it on, and then time when you take it off and put it in a protected place. Okay. We have another question here is coming in from uh, this one's coming from Afghanistan. So, uh, how would you get the information from a regulator on whether certain PPE is in violation? Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how that would be done in Pakistan. I'm not familiar with that. But, but basically, the regulator is going to have the required PPE uh, in his hands, and he can check to see whether you have the required PPE, whether you have and are using the required PPE for that particular product. Yeah. And that's all label based. Uh, and I think that's any place in the world they're going to have that. Very good, Dr. Kaler. We really do appreciate the uh, the information. Uh, I've never seen a safety talk like that. It was very good. Thank you.